The culture war in the present generation is fundamentally about what C.S. Lewis called the Tao. Now, Lewis introduced this term in his little book, The Abolition of Man, in which he sets forth two fundamentally different visions of reality. The Tao is Lewis's term for the objective and rational moral order embedded in the cosmos and in human nature. Other names for it might be natural law or traditional morality. But Lewis borrowed the term from Eastern religions, both for the sake of brevity, it just rolls off the tongue, and in order to stress its universality. Lewis claimed that a belief in this objective, rational, and moral order is present not only in Christianity, but in Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, the Greek and Roman philosophical tradition, even ancient paganism. Whatever differences exist among them, and there are substantial and significant ones, the common thread is a belief in the doctrine of objective value. So until modern times, almost everyone believed that our thoughts and our emotions should be conformed to objective reality. Objects in the world could merit our approval or our disapproval, our reverence or our contempt. Certain attitudes and emotions are really true to reality and others really false. So for example, when we call children delightful, we're not simply recording a psychological fact about ourselves. We're recognizing a quality in them that demands a certain response from us, whether we give it or not. And if we fail to give it, if we fail to feel it, we are wrong. Lewis himself uh, did not enjoy the company of small children, ironic for the author of Narnia. And he regarded that as a defect in himself, like being tone deaf or colorblind. And so for those within the Tao, when our thoughts correspond to reality, we speak of truth. When our emotions and our will correspond to reality, we speak of goodness. And these are objective categories and the source of all value judgments and universally binding. Lewis writes, only the Tao provides a common human law of action which can overarch rulers and ruled alike. The Tao binds and restrains all men from commoners to kings from citizens to leaders. Now, in opposition to the Tao stands the modern ideology which Lewis calls the poison of subjectivism. He describes it as an existential threat to Western civilization and humanity. It enables tyranny and totalitarianism. It upends the ancient and humane way of viewing the world. So, in under subjectivism, reason itself is debunked. Today, we would say deconstructed. Instead of our thoughts corresponding to objective reality, human reason is simply a brain secretion of no more significance than a burp. What makes, well, this makes logic uh, subjective, and thus we have no reason to believe that our reason can yield truth. It's simply the epiphenomenon that accompanies certain chemical reactions in our brains, which are the result of blind evolutionary processes. Likewise, moral value judgments are simply projections of irrational emotions onto an indifferent cosmos. Truth and goodness, these are just words that we apply to our own subjective and psychological states, states that we have been socially conditioned to have. And so, because rational thought is merely brain secretion and value judgments are merely irrational projections, the imposition of reason and morality in a society is always a dressed up power play and the subjectivists want the power. Thus, they say, traditional values are to be debunked and mankind will be cut into some fresh shape at the arbitrary will of conditioners who view people as raw material for experimentation. In other words, nature, including human nature, is just Plato, to be needed and reshaped according to the wishes of the conditioners. Because Lewis knew that when we speak of man's power over nature, what we really must mean is the power of some men over other men with nature as its instrument. So what does this have to do with the culture war? Put simply, American culture is an expression of the Tao. From our founding documents to our customs and practices, from sea to shining sea, American culture for most of our history has been firmly grounded in an express belief in the objective moral and rational order of the universe. 
Now, this doesn't mean that we've always lived up to the Tao. Various times, America has grossly failed to abide by, by the basic principles of justice and fairness of the Tao, of the golden rule. We can think of Jim Crow. But the civil rights movement was built on a, as an appeal to the Tao. If you read Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, he appeals to the scriptures, to the Western theological and philosophical tradition, and to America's own heritage because he knows that America professes to live within a moral order. But living within the Tao is not the same as living up to the Tao. Nevertheless, imperfect and flawed as it has been, the civilizational <clears throat> embrace of the Tao has historically been a crucial feature of American society. As the National Conservatism Statement of Prim uh, Principles notes, America's embrace of the Tao has come through the Bible. Quote, for, the, for millennia, the Bible has been our surest guide, nourishing a fitting orientation toward God, to the political traditions of the nation, to public morals, to the defense of the weak, and to the recognitions of things rightly regarded as sacred. And so the scriptures bear witness to an objective moral order, and thus the Tao through this Bible is part of our patrimony, our inheritance. In terms of order, the scriptures and the Tao speak with one voice. Nevertheless, rebellion against this order is possible and can be temporarily effective. I say temporarily because falling feels like flying until you hit the ground. Richard Hooker, the English theologian, once wrote, perverted and wicked customs, perhaps beginning with a few and then spreading to the multitude and then continuing for a long time, may be so strong that they smother the light of our natural understanding. Lewis notes that when all that says it is good has been debunked, what says I want remains. And our society is debunking it is good and reordering itself around I want. Science and technology are now employed in service of I want. Indeed, the major institutions of society, big business, big education, big tech, big media, big entertainment, big pharma, and big government are all in service of subjectivism in service of the almighty, I want. And not only that, they are in the business of shaping and conditioning the I wants of us and our children and then enforcing I want on those still clinging to, it is good. Thus, we feel the cultural, social, even legal pressure to speak nonsense, to participate in the lie, to conform to the wicked custom. We, we must affirm that Rachel Levine is a woman, that pronouns are private property, that the mutilation of healthy organs is gender-affirming care, and that dismembering a child in utero is about a woman's reproductive health. This is the fundamental cultural conflict in our times. The Tao or chaos? The Tao or absurdity? It is good, I want. So what does this mean for us? Fundamentally, it means we must seek to recover the Tao, this objective moral order, in our nation's life. And this includes both securing the vestiges of the Tao that persist in our culture. Think about Governor DeSantis' parents who heard the idea that a boy could become a girl through surgery and said, that ain't a thing. We can secure the vestiges that remain as well as restoring those that have been temporarily lost or smothered so they don't continue for a long time. Among other things, this of course means our laws ought to be grounded in the fundamental moral order of the universe. It's good when human laws reflect and apply the Tao in concrete circumstances. Those kind of laws restrain evil. Again, Martin Luther King, it may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. It may be true that the law can't make a man love me, but it can restrain him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. And so today we might say, it would be good if doctors did not castrate boys and mutilate girls because they themselves want to live within the Tao. But short of that, it's good if doctors refuse to do so because if they do, they'll go to jail. They'll bring down upon their heads both civil and criminal penalties. So recovering the Tao means confidently resisting the imposition and spread of wicked custom. And I stress confidently because though reality can be shaped within limits, there are real boundaries built in. The world, including human nature, is not infinitely malleable. 
We are not in a fight with the left over control of the Plato because reality is not Plato. It has real integrity, real unity, real design and purpose. And so when we seek to resist wicked custom and recover the moral order, we should do so in the confidence we are cutting with the grain of the way the world is. And then let me underscore that we have to do this wholesale, not piecemeal. This means, among other things, we cannot abandon marriage. We must not succumb to Chesterton's indictment when he said it's the job of progressives to break things and the job of conservatives to make sure they don't get fixed. Despite the legal and cultural situation we faced, we must continue to insist that marriage is the lifelong union of one man and one woman for the purpose of companionship, mutual help, and procreation. It was, it was a... It was established by God and is bound up with our obligations to our ancestors and to our posterity. And the temptation to abandon the definition of marriage in the present moment is very, very great. But let's be clear. Living within the Tao means faithfully naming the world. It means that human language and human law ought to reflect the objective moral and rational order. So if we want to resist the fantasy and folly that Rachel Levine is a woman, we must also resist the fantasy and folly that two men can be married to each other. We, we, can't, we, can't mock, we can't mock Justice Jackson for being unable to answer what is a woman if we mumble into the microphone when asked what is marriage. Obergefell, like Roe before it, is both unconstitutional and in high-handed rebellion against reality, and it unleashed chaos and absurdity into the body politic. Yes, marriage was already weakened by no-fault divorce and destigmatizing adultery and fornication. The, the lusts, desires, and sinful passions of men had done a number on marriage, but those passions and desires had, in some measure, been restrained by our laws and our customs flowing from the Tao. Obergefell unleashed them, placed them in the driver's seat to the harm of children, the weakening of the social order and the natural family, leading to the transgender chaos in which we live. So, remember, you cannot be a little bit pregnant. He who says A must say B. He who says LGB must say TQ+. The move from one to the other is just what cancer does when left untreated. And so part of our task is to help regular Americans see the organic connection between same-sex mirage and the transgender insanity. The left, the left is trying to use cultural acceptance of LGB to press for TQ+. We must labor to use the human recoil against TQ plus to roll back the wicked custom of LGB. And, and this will require, this will require, this is not going to be easy. We're, don't be under any illusions. This will require the same kind of intentional, patient, and courageous clarity that has marked the pro-life movement for over 50 years, but led to the overthrow of Roe v. Wade. So a conservatism that is unwilling to conserve the most fundamental institution of human society is worthless. Let's not be worthless. So, recovering the Tao is about more than simply a change of laws, as important as that is. Instead, we should aim for the Tao, this moral order to be practiced in our homes, preached in our pulpits, taught in our schools, expressed in our stories, And this is necessary for human flourishing and the protection of children and the honoring of parents and the promotion of justice and the prevention of civilizational ruin. But let me say a word to my Christian brothers and sisters. Connecting the recovery of the Tao in American society to the mission of the church. A society that seeks to live within the Tao is a society constantly engaged in pre-evangelism. Here's how C.S. Lewis put it. When grave persons express their fear that England is relapsing into paganism, 
I am tempted to reply, would that she were. For I do not think it at all likely that we shall ever see Parliament opened by the slaughtering of a garlanded white bull in the House of Lords, or cabinet ministers leaving sandwiches in Hyde Park as an offering for the dryads. Though perhaps Charles III has other ideas, I don't know. If such a state of affairs came about, then the Christian apologist would have something to work on. For a pagan, as history shows, is a man eminently convertible to Christianity. He is essentially the pre-Christian or sub-Christian religious man. The post-Christian man of our day differs from him as much as a divorcee differs from a virgin. The Christian and the pagan have much more in common with one another than either has with the modern subjectivists. Now, Lewis mentions here full paganism. We might instead speak of cultural Christianity. Like classical pagans, those who are merely cultural Christians are eminently convertible, which is why I don't join those Christians who welcome the demise of cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity, so the argument goes, was a hindrance to the gospel. It lulled people into a false sense of security. It covered over rank evil, and it was a stumbling block to unbelievers, and so they say, good riddance. Now, it may be truth to some of that criticism. Cultural Christianity, to the degree that it covered over sin and wickedness, was hated by Almighty God, and we ought to condemn it. But, however imperfect, it was and is a manifestation of the Tao. And in that sense, it tills the soil to prepare it for seed. As Lewis said, it gives us something to work on and to work with. It teaches through laws and customs and cultural practices the reality of the Tao, of God's moral order. And so while cultural Christianity never saved anyone, it did give many a sense of sin and guilt, which they have, which prepared them for the good news of Jesus. So let me close with this. Those in the Tao know that governments, institutions, and civilizations exist for something more important than themselves. They are all mortal. They will pass away. But they exist to serve people who are destined for eternal joy or eternal misery. And the least we can ask of our institutions is, they, is that they put no stumbling block in the way of the former and no slippery slope toward the latter. And so the recovery of the Tao is important, but it's also insufficient. This is because while the Tao is crucial for teaching what is good and for restraining what is evil, it's ultimately impotent to deal with our greatest need. The Tao tells us how we ought to live. We then discover that we don't live that way. We fail again and again, and we fail miserably. It tells us we ought to value things according to their value. And we discover we've not done so. In particular, we have not valued what is supremely valuable. That is, we have not valued God, treasured God, loved God with all that we are. And so what are we to do? Earlier I noted that the scriptures and the Tao speak with one voice. Now we must identify whose voice it is. And so in answer to Yoram's exhortation earlier today, let me simply quote, close by quoting the scriptures from Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and, and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Thank you.